Hello and welcome to this two-part session on new genres of dance. Today we are going to deal with part one and uh, it is a reflection really of the development of the national stage and the coming together of various dance practices in India. Now, as you well know now, uh, as postgraduate students of dance studies, as part of the national movement, when the arts helped us build our own national identity um, and made us feel like a nation, the splendid isolation that many of the dance forms had experienced till then came to an end. Admittedly, some of the early institutions like the Gandharv Mahavidyalaya Sanstans focused on the pursuit of single arts, music in this case. There were a few exceptions, however, to this argument of isolation. As in the case of the sudden arrival of Bharatnatyam in Vadodara, as part of the Tanjore Prince's uh, Chimna Bai's uh, dowry. It, when she married the Maharaja of Baroda, Sayaji Rao Gaikwad III in 1883, uh, along with her came a dance troupe of Bharatnatyam dancers. Of course, it was not called Bharatnatyam then, but this planted Bharatnatyam into a soil which was not originally uh, its own. Then there were some cultural institutions that were sort of pushing the artistic renaissance. Tagore's Vishwabharti in Shantiniketan, built in 1921 out of the funds that he received uh, as a result of the Nobel, Pre uh, Nobel Prize for Literature that he got. Vishwabharti was built uh, as a reaction to Western education, which Tagore had encountered when he was studying in England. Tagore offered an alternative model of education in the vision and the life that he promoted in Shantiniketan. A close relationship with nature was one example and a close association with arts and creativity was another example of its mainstay principles. Tagore himself was a painter, a poet and a musician and after that he came to dance. He came to dance last when he was a mature man. Thus, he had a mature, sagacious and open-minded approach to it. He had already written extensively on it in his literary works. Take Chitrangada, take Natir Puja. He had written far before he had begun dancing. He recognized that dance was a very uh, creative way of getting women involved in a public role. Thus for him, the spirit was more important than the rules and regulations of any style. As the spirit freed while rules and regulations shackled. That is why Vishwabharti's dancing style what is known as, you know, the Rabindra Sang dance style that accompanies Rabindra Sangeet, does not clearly prescribe to any form, accounting for why Shanti Niketan has a very free-flowing feel to its dance. Other institutions that were affecting a renaissance in the arts were Kerala Kalamandalam, built in 1930 with the poet Valatol and Mukund Raja as co-founders and Rukmini Devi's Kalakshetra built in 1936. They were encouraging the arts to come close in a creatively salubrious environment. For instance, in 1940, Kathakali Asan, T.K. Chandupanikar joined Kalakshetra and taught many including V.P. Dhananjayan. Since then, in the ballets produced by Kalakshetra, one of the flavors is that of Kathakali. Similarly, in Shanti Niketan, it was Manipuri dance that found a new location and left an indelible mark on the dance cultures associated with Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore. 
Interestingly, in the initial years, the Manipuri teachers of Shanti Niketan came via the Tripura route and not directly from Manipur. Apart from Manipuri, Shanti Niketan hosted Kathakali and Mohini Attam from Kerala. As a result of his overseas travels, Tagore was also acquainted with Kandyan, Javanese and Balinese dances, elements of which he was able to incorporate in the Shantiniketan style of dancing. The Selenese dance was formally taught at Shantiniketan. After travelling the world and having tasted international fame with his Uday Shankar troupe of Hindu dancers that did a hard to pinpoint to any one known dance style, it was in 1938 that he finally made India his base and established the Uday Shankar India Cultural Centre at the Himalayan village of Simtola, three kilometres from Almora, in what is now Uttarakhand. Here he invited Shankara Nambudri for Kathakali, Kandappa Pillai for Bharatnatyam, Amobi Singh for Manipuri and Alauddin Khan, his brother's guru, known for his Catholic approach to teach music. A large assemblage of performers was drawn to this sylvan setting where the best masters came together to create possibly India's first multi-style training centre. The centre had some commonalities with Tagore's Vishwabharti in as much as there was closeness to nature and the environment was creative and non-restrictive. The Uday Shankar centre however closed after four years. Due to paucity of funds. But its place in history cannot be ignored, for it was the first time that different dance forms were living and working so closely together. The work that thus emerged was described as a renaissance of sorts and helped free the Indian cultural mind to some extent. It would appear that it was for the churning that was happening at the Uday Shankar Centre in Simtola that these lines were written where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where the words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee, into ever-widening thought and action. So liberating was the environment in Simtola that despite the heartbreak of having to leave it in 1948, Uday Shankar made his magnum opus film Kalpana at Chennai's Gemini studio using a dance language that was unique and which may be described as being reflective of the totality of India as it captured the diversity of many dance forms in a creative manner. Even as the new nation was being created, this creative language of dance that Shankar was using seemed reflective of the process of creating the nation. Inspired by the idea of a multi-art centre, some of the centres that came up in post-independent India took on a multiple arts profile and became associated with the revival of those arts that were seeing poorer days or were even languishing. Though they picked up such arts in an opportunistic manner, in the sense when they were provided grants or when a practitioner was available to lead the department, their work soon bore the impress of the many streams of dancers. Many of these centres were located in Delhi which was fast becoming the cultural capital of the country. The case of Sri Ram Bharti Kala Kendra is an example. Set up originally in 1947 as Jankar, it became a formal school in 1952. Under the guidance of Sumitra Charitram, it attracted the finest talent. Among those who were associated with the Kendra in the initial years in its faculty were Pandit Chambu Maharaj and Pandit Birju Maharaj for Kathak, who created some significant work to the music of the Daga brothers who were also there. Soon the Kendra was to add on Kathakali and Mayurbhanj sections. The Kendra takes the credit for uplifting Kathak 
when it was going through a bad phase before the Kathak Kendra was established by the government of India. It was also able to give Mayurbhan Chau a fresh lease of life and with these diverse inputs ended up creating a series of dance dramas and ballets that showcased them. The first such major experiment that the Kendra created was Ram Leela that is now an institution as it gets performed annually. The first production took place in 1957. The script was written by the Hindi poet Ramdhari Singh Dinkar with lights designed by Tapas Sen and Indra Razdan. Uday Shankar's colleague, dancer Narendra Sharma, was a principal dancer along with his wife Jayanti Sharma. None other than the Prime Minister of India inaugurated the Ram Leela performance. Subsequent to the success of the Ram Leela, Sri Ram Bharti Kala Kendra created a whole range of memorable ballets using the language of Mayurban Chau in a creative manner. Soon, the Ram Leela too began to bear the impress of the various departments of dance styles that the Kendra had opened. Dance energy and kinetics are contagious after all. In the early years of the nation, the arts, particularly dance, was used as a tool for diplomacy. Around the same time, before visiting dignitaries at Rashtrapati Bhavan, a tradition began of showcasing the art of India, particularly the classical arts of India. Thus, 10 to 15 minute pieces were presented by different artists. Some of the artists themselves performed more than one dance in an evening as they had taken training for a few items in many styles. Shanta Rao, Indrani Rahman, Vajanti Malabali, Yamani Krishnamurti come to mind. These dancers would perform at least two, if not more, styles in every performance. Indrani would dance Bharatnatyam for the first part and then Odissi for the second. Shantara would do Kathakali and then Mohiniyattam. Yamni Krishnamurti had learned Bharatnatyam, Odissi and Kuchipuri and could do any of these singly, jointly or in combination. These pioneers of dance did yeoman service to popularize the many dance forms of India when very few modern educated women were dancing publicly. Slowly, the critical mass of dancers, dance forms and the dance repertoire in each form grew enough to create a robust dance scene in India that was aware of the many dance forms that existed and that had begun valorizing dance. A big change from the days that saw its suffering a stigma. The annual Republic Day Parade showcases India's defence capability, cultural and social heritage. This is a rare case of a Ministry of Defence managed endeavour, which includes so much culture, albeit all of it moving at the pace of military boots and to military precision, with dancing troops coming from states, from NCC battalions and from local schools with fascinating imaginative state floats often carrying dancers as signifiers of cultural identity. The Republic Day Parade is richly endowed with a dance quotient. The accompanying Republic Day Dance Festival with almost a thousand dancers each evening herded in expertly by the baton of a show choreographer makes one encounter the Union of India. For years, this event has sensitized Indians to the diversity of India's cultural scape. However, the parade has played an intrusive and transformative role in the dances that it carries along. First, by decontextualizing them, and then by altering the choreographic patterns of the dances into predominantly straight-lined patterns as a columns and rows of dancers all of whom wear shoes, move in step with the soldiers and members of police and paramilitary forces. Still, the sheer opulence of colours, costumes, dance movements, songs and the joy that is dance makes our chest swell up with pride. This is truly unity in diversity at play. With the Asian Games of 1982, India developed a culture of presenting herself as a grand spectacle built around almost industrial-sized troops of dancers. The first such experiment was contained in the opening ceremony of the Asian Games. 
classical dance was dismissed immediately as unsuitable. Instead, 7,000 folk dancers, for whom an entire township with its own post office and police station was set up, had to grip the attention of 75,000 people in a football field 10,000 square meters big. The smaller segments from each state were choreographed separately, each one distinct in its formations, music and concept. None other than Birju Maharaj choreographed Uttar Pradesh's folk dance around the theme of Holi. Like a patchwork quilt, the whole was woven from the paths into a seamless spectacle in Delhi by Narendra Sharma, who had been trained in choreography at the Uday Shankar Center in Almora and thereafter in Russia, a country known for the ease with which it conceives and hosts cultural extravaganzas. Interestingly, it needed the might of the army to put this into place and make it move smoothly without egos coming into the way so that there were no embarrassing gaffes, lack of precision when the eyes of the world were focused on India. By the time of the Commonwealth Games of 2010, the doubt that classical dance could not make the grade for such a spectacle had long gone and so a segment called the Tree of Knowledge incorporated classical dance. Kathak Gurus, Pandit Birju Maharaj, Manipuri Gurus, Manipuri Gurus, Rajkumar Singhajit Singh and his wife Charu Sija Mathur, Bharat Natyam Guru, Dr. Saroja Vaidyanathan, Urisi Guru, Dr. Sonal Man Singh, Mohini Atam Gurus, Bharti Shivaji, Kuchipuri Gurus, Raja Radha Reddy used as many as 480 dancers to bring alive India's Guru Shishya Parampara on stage through classical dance recitals, which also depicted the four different seasons of India. The idea was further reinforced by the use of technology as the aerostat, the largest ever helium balloon built for such an event, formed the leaves of the Bodhi tree, while large strips of cloth elevated from the ground made of silk and bamboo fiber formed the tree trunk. A strange fusion of multiple dances came to the fore as India became a mice destination. Now what does mice mean? Mice stands for meetings, incentives, conferences and events. This aspect of bringing together many classical dances onto the same stage with the goal of drawing eyeballs to produce a wow reaction is the work of the Ministry of Tourism and its Incredible India campaign. What could be a more incredible image of the gorgeous splendors of India than a host of bejeweled and bedecked dancers representing amongst them all eight classical dance styles of India? configuring in elegant patterns and statuesque poses on one shared stage for a brief while. Intense visual splendor. Possibly the original inspiration came from the Mile Sur Mera Tumhara video. You remember that? It was a multilingual song video promoting national integration by featuring the most important of, India, uh, of Indian musicians. It was, it was telecast on Doordarshan for the first time on Independence Day in 1988 as soon as the telecast of the Prime Minister's speech from the Red Fort was over. It was available only on Doordarshan and had a very large impact as Doordarshan was then the only channel available in India. It quickly captivated India, gaining and maintaining a near anthem-like status which it has retained even now. In the same vein, to mark the 50th year of India's independence in 1997, A.R. Rahman came out with an album called Vande Matram, which had the title song sung by him. It is the largest selling Indian non-film album to date. It had a profoundly positive and unifying impact on the nationalistic and patriotic mood of the country. The videos that Bharat Bala Productions made on them 
featured maestros like Guru Kelucharan Mahapatra and young dancers like the French Kathak dancer Veronique Azan, along with sundry folk dancers. These vignettes were telecast repeatedly on TV and had a powerful impact. They came across as a continuing ripple of the music video, achieving much the same end by kindling a feeling of patriotism and nationalism. Let me come to one of the finest recent examples of soft power and how the soft power of the arts was used in a hard-nosed manner to push for an economic benefit. Now this was contained in the Make in India initiative of the Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi which was launched recently in Germany in the presence of Mr. Modi and Ms. Merkel. The incredibly colourful spectacle of dance and exuberance which opened uh, the Prime Minister's speech at Hanover, which is the world's biggest industrial fair, was created by dancer-choreographer Mayuri Upadhyay and her sister Madhuri Upadhyay. You will be surprised to know that Mayuri and Madhuri are very young, very dynamic, very much in tune with new technology and always ready to experiment. Although they have been trained in Bharatanatyam, Kathak, Odissi, Kalaripayat, folk and modern dance. Mayuri is the principal choreographer of the dance company Mritya Ritya, uh, which is a dance collective. Uh, she has also choreographed for the Kannad film industry and has recently made her Bollywood debut as well. You may have noticed her as a judge on Dancing with the Stars 2, which was a reality show. Now, with this large and varied experience, she was at an advantage when, under her baton, she brought in 94 dancers who got to perform together in a suite of 14 different acts. This Make in India production was in 14 different acts. It also included a very generous use of multimedia inputs. All of this was worked out within a period of 30 days. Initial work was done independently by each group with virtual supervision, making the best use of modern technology. The choreography interpreted the Prime Minister's call to make in India. It encompassed the spirit of a younger, progressive India and simultaneously brought out the rich heritage of India through a contemporary feel to it. It incorporated a diverse range of tangible and intangible lived and preserved elements of culture. It began with yoga to soothing music. It introduced eight classical dance forms introduced puppetry, martial arts and linked them all together in the form of a beautiful Rangoli design. Even the ritualistic practice of the Ganga Aarti on the banks of Banaras with the chanting of mantras was included as an example of living culture. Imagine what thought must have gone behind it. Imagine what detail was part of this planning. Imagine how everything was knitted together seamlessly. The spectacular optic had a breath-stopping moment with the appearance of a 3D tiger. You know, the 3D tiger is a logo of Make in India. Well, this 3D tiger depicted the technological advancement of the country, bringing in a sense of grandeur to the production. Not that it was lacking any grandeur if you go by the description that I have told you about. Do try and see it on the internet if you have not seen a telecast of it. It really shows you how things come in together and why we need to bring things together because it's no longer the time of independent and separated life. It is the age of the World Wide Web. It is the age of coming together 
interacting, integrating for a bigger push forward. Mm -hmm.